So what does scripture say about in the beginning? Well, the Bible says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Whereas evolution says, no, there was a big bang. And after a long period, we get the stars, and then we get the sun, and the earth doesn't appear until a long way down that line. So it, God didn't create the heavens and the earth. He created the heavens, yes, and a long time after would create the earth if we're going to accept evolutionary ideas. But the Bible is very consistent that the earth and the heavens were made at the same time in the beginning. So I'm not expecting you to be able to read, that's Genesis chapter one and chapter two, but it just gives us a framework. So that opening phrase, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, uh, opens the chapter, and it comes to a conclusion in chapter 2 and verse 1, where it says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. So here's a definite statement that in the beginning, or whenever that was, God created the heavens and the earth. And then it tells us how he created the heavens and the earth, and how they were finished, and how all the host of them uh, was completed in this period termed in the Bible, in the beginning. And so that first verse is the opening of an unfolding record. And the chapter tells us step by step how God uh, achieved this creation of the heavens and the earth and all the host of them and how that work was finished. And very interestingly, in the Hebrew Bible, um, every verse, apart from the first verse, begins with this little connection word, wah. In the authorised version, we have the word and. To show it's an unfolding list, step by step by step, from an initial creating of the heavens and the earth without any form, without any shape, without anything in it, to at the end of that period of time, end of the six days and the seventh day of the Sabbath, that the earth was full of glory and shape and beauty and abundant animals and plants and trees and Adam and Eve. And so a wonderful, continuous unfolding. And Hebrew scholars, and I'm not a Hebrew scholar, tell us that you can't have a gap. It, it, it is all one onflowing record from the beginning to the end. Now, this is all in preparation for God's work of redemption. God knew that man would fall, that there would be a need for a saviour to come, the Lord Jesus Christ. A thousand years after the fall of Adam, the Lord Jesus came upon the earth. But this work of uh, preparation was necessary because for there to be God's redeeming work for mankind, well, you need a place for it. You, you need an earth. You need there to be light. You need there to be water uh, and atmosphere and plants and planets and stars and birds and fish and animals. And, of course, you need man for God's work to proceed. So this opening chapter of Genesis chapter 1 to verse 3 of chapter 2 uh, is God's preparation for this future work of uh, redemption, which of course is not our, our subject for these talks. Now, when we come to the New Testament and we read what the Lord Jesus has to say about these things, he tells us in what well, was recorded in Matthew chapter 19, have ye not read, he that made them in the beginning made them male and female. 
So he's making it quite clear that as far as he, the Lord Jesus, is concerned, God in creating the heavens and the earth and man, that was all part of this period of in the beginning. So the sixth day when man was created is part of this period of in the beginning. Totally different from the ideas of evolution, where um, Adam and Eve comes at the end of a very long period of time, whereas the Bible says Adam and Eve were made there in the beginning. And so that's the Bible message. And so it's clear that this period of in the beginning was a seven-day period. Um, and I believe some 6,000 years ago when God created the heavens and the earth. And the Mark account just adds a little bit more detail, but from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. So that's Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2. Um, for this call shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. So these are the words of the Lord Jesus. Now, we can't say, well, of course, Jesus was uh, talking about the, his, the thinking of his time period, because we have uh, a very clear record written by Moses, who we believe wrote down Genesis. But in Deuteronomy, God says to Moses, that I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee, Moses, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I command him. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my word, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. So that makes it quite clear that the words that Jesus spoke as recorded in the Gospels, are words which God put in his mouth. These aren't, weren't Jesus' ideas. These were given him by his heavenly Father. And so we can put complete trust in what he had to say, that the beginning of creation involved Adam and Eve being created. And the Apostle Peter on the um, day of Pentecost, or well, it was on the following day, um, confirms that <clears throat> this passage about this prophet was indeed talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have the very clear statement in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 11. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So a very clear statement that it was a six-day active work of creation plus a day of rest to form a seven-day cycle that started with the creation of the heavens and the earth and finished with a beautiful world. And we know that Adam and Eve were living for part of the sixth day and all the seventh day. Uh, we know that Adam, with the genealogy, tells us that he died at the age of 930. So clearly, you know, these days of creation aren't long periods of time. They are um, what they say they are, because otherwise it would be much older than 930 if he'd lived through the seventh day being a long period of time. So in the beginning was a six, it was a seven day period because we include the day of rest. And Genesis chapter two, verse two, confirms all of this. On the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made and rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. So this is the final confirmation that God had ended his work. So there was a, a beginning and that beginning 
took seven days for it all to be completed, but it was created in the heaven and the earth, not heaven for a long period on its own, and then a long time afterwards the earth. The Bible is very specific. So in the beginning was a seven-day period, including the creation of the heavens and the earth. And we know that God created a mature earth. It wasn't uh, just a day old earth, as it were. It tells us very clearly that the earth brought forth grass and the herb yielding seed after his kind and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good. So although initially the grass sprouted out of the earth, by supernatural means, by the end of the day, we have not only grasses uh, fully mature with fruit on, seeds on, we have fruit trees uh, which grew and what normally takes 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, all very rapidly took place upon that day. God has that power to do it. So, there was at the end of the day when these things were created, they were mature. It, if we'd chopped down one of the trees, it would have had tree rings in because they play an important role in the stability of the tree. God doesn't deceive us. He, he told us what he did. He created it mature. And when we think of what the Lord Jesus did, of turning water into wine. This normally is a process, it takes place every year. The rain falls upon the earth, uh, on the vines, the vines absorb uh, the water, the grapes grow, uh, mature, and then eventually turned into wine. Normally it takes a whole year, doesn't it, of a cycle from the beginning of the year to being able to drink the fruit of the vine. You see, Jesus, in his miracle of turning water into wine, was able to do that in an instant. So the servants filled up the water pots with water, took them to the ruler of the feast. He drew out and said, this is the most wonderful wine. You normally keep the best wine. Uh, I have that at the beginning, not at the end of the feast. So what, what normally would take place uh, over many months, the Lord Jesus was able to perform in an instant of time. And so it was with uh, the rest of creation. As far as the animals were concerned, um, they brought forth after their kinds. They were fully mature, able to reproduce, see full of fishes, land full of different animals, a, a, a wonderful, wonderful thing. But they'd only just been brought into being that day, but as mature creatures. And the final part, man. God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them. This wasn't a day old baby. God blessed them and said unto them, be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over everything that moveth upon the earth. So at the end of seven days, there we have a fully mature earth, fully mature creatures, fully mature trees, fully mature Adonai, capable of obeying orders, and able to reproduce. So salt in the sea, carbon dioxide in the air, everything that we know today as our earth was there at the end of the seven days, everything fully mature. So we can see that that first assumption we start from nothing is a wrong assumption if we are prepared to accept the Bible, which the Bible is something, a record, given once for all time, and has been shown to be correct in all its stages. The more man discovers, 
the more it points to a wonderful creator who has uh, brought all these things into being. Uh, uh, and the Bible tells of a catastrophic flood so that this uh, present is the key to the past. Uh, uniformitarianism uh, can't be correct because it tells us about this great flood upon the earth and the waters increasing and bearing up the ark and it was lifted up above the earth and the waters prevailed and were increased greatly upon the earth and the ark went upon the face of the waters and the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered 15 cubits upward did the waters prevail and the mountains were covered. An absolute catastrophe. And it's so interesting that in the middle of this account, it, it just has a throwaway line, a seemingly throwaway line, that all the mountains were covered uh, by more than 15 cubits of water. Now, we understand that the Mount Everest wasn't the height it is today before the flood. Uh, hills were much lower, and part of the uh, receding of the water from the flood was to cause the mountains to rise so the water would come down. But the interesting thing is, why does it say 15 cubits? Well, the ark, we're told, was 30 cubits high, and a rule of thumb, um, it depends on the vessel, but a pretty good rule of thumb, is a laden vessel. It sinks about half its depth into the water. So what it's telling us here, that it was safe for the ark to travel everywhere because God had covered the mountains by at least 15 cubits of water. So it wouldn't ground. It tells us that everything died. Uh, and there was total wipeout of all land creatures, the sea creatures weren't taken onto the ark because they were able to survive, but all the land creatures, pairs of land creatures were all taken onto the ark in order that they might be have a new beginning when the flood subsided. But the water was upon the earth for a long, long time. We're told there that the waters prevailed upon the earth in 150 days, that means the waters were rising for 150 days. And the Bible tells us that for 250 days they were subsiding. So the water was on the earth for a total of 370 days, Genesis 8 verse 14 tells us. Now, if rocks have been under water, water is a wonderful leaching agent, and if rocks have been under water, then if we're trying to measure infinitely small elements within it, then we would expect a lot of them to have been lost by the flood, which would make the earth appear older than it really is. So the present isn't the key to the past, we believe, because of this catastrophic flood. We read that the Foundations of the earth were broken up and the windows of heaven opened and this rained for 40 days. This was a tremendous catastrophe that brought to an end our first life. But it was preserved in the ark and the new beginning was made with Noah and his three sons and their wives. Now the Bible reveals itself as a historical record, as a record that we can take and use to see just how God has worked. Uh, and there's no reason to think that Genesis chapter 1, 2 and chapter 11, and the early chapters of Genesis, don't fit in with this book, which is a chronological book. Because we can work out where we are in the time scale. Because in Genesis chapter 5, we have numerous genealogies which take us from creation to the time of the flood. 
and we can work out that that's 1,656 years from creation to the flood. And then again, Genesis and chapter 11 gives us other genealogies which take us to the 85th year of Abraham's life, a period of 377 years. And the 85th year of Abraham is important because there's a, a time bridge, as it were. We're told that from uh, when he was called to the time of the Exodus was a period of 430 years. Galatians chapter <laughs> to 3 and verse 17 tells us that. And then the Exodus, we know, took 40 years and 30 years to conquer. And then again, another time bridge from the conquest of the land to the time of Samuel, Acts chapter 13 and verse 20 tells us was 450 years. And again, we can work out then to Solomon and the fourth year of his reign when he began to build the temple was about 84 years. And so we have a period of about 3,067 years from creation to the fourth year of Solomon's temple. Now, again, the fourth year when he built the temple is an important time bridge because Ezekiel tells us in chapter 4 and verse 6 of 430 years until that temple was destroyed by the Babylonians. And then we have the prophet Daniel, who witnessed many of these things and was taken into captivity. Um, in later life, he had an important prophecy of 70 weeks, and we can work out that was about 51 years from when the temple was destroyed. And that 70 weeks or 490 days or 490 year it was pointing to was from when he gave the prophecy, when a certain thing would happen in that prophecy, to the crucifixion, 490 years. That's Daniel chapter 9. And then if we believe that Jesus was born just a bit BC uh, and the crucifixion at about uh, AD 30, then we're 19,000 1,993 years to today. So again, no, we add these time periods up. It comes to about 6,031 years from creation. So the Bible is a historical book and we can read it as a historical book. So when God says, I did this in six days, seven days, then we can believe it. That is what God has revealed for us. He is the creator of all things, we believe. Uh, and the Bible is his wonderful record so that men and women of all ages can come to know the God of Israel, the God of the Bible, and his wonderful work of redemption. So we'll just have a quick pause and we'll then resume with uh, part two, where we'll look at some of the many evidences for recent creation. Thank you.